my name again, Frank Peters, and I'm going to share with you some lessons I've learned from the world of art and how I've applied them to my life as an entrepreneur. You know, I never took a class in college in art, and that was uh, my mistake, I suppose. I was all math and science, but I did date and eventually marry a girl from fine arts. We used to audit each other's classes. Uh, she would go to my astronomy class, and I would go to her nude modeling classes. <laughs> my career as an entrepreneur began much earlier. Here I am as a paper boy for the Boston Globe. And I don't think there are any more paper boys or paper girls gone the way of the horse and buggy. My dad said I would learn a lot about people delivering the paper. It wasn't the act of delivering the paper, it was the collecting the money. <laughs> and uh, I, as a young man, I always had money in my pocket, and uh, I had to be. I was the oldest of six. I had to buy all my own clothes. I paid for my way through private high school, then college, graduated with no, uh, you know, uh, education loans, so that was positive. It would be another 20 years before I would be an entrepreneur again. I started Plaid Brothers Software. We wrote uh, software, today you'd call it CRM, Customer Relationship Management. People would often ask me, how did I come up with the name? Here's how. <laughs> our, our wives took this picture, my brother and I, in the kitchen cooking up one of mom's old recipes. The girls used this picture to make fun of our startup business. Why would they do that? They weren't necessarily cruel people, but uh, we were struggling to make ends meet. We struggled mightily. Um, we struggled because uh, we had no money, no plan, and no strategy. <laughs> but we did have a great market, and our portfolio management software was uh, slowly but surely becoming a very hot product on Wall Street. And as they say, after only 15 years, I was an overnight success. <laughs> there were many large companies uh, kind of circling around looking to buy us. And after 15 years, can you imagine, I was tired writing the software in Irvine, all the customers in New York. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very tiring. But it was a happy ending. And as I look back, on that experience, I think of all the great timing, uh, certainly the luck and hard work that went into it, but this logo was a great brand. We put it on everything, uh, everything we could. People loved it. We put it on t-shirts. And uh, here, apparently, uh, Steve Ballmer, president of Microsoft, got up this morning for his Business Week interview and put on our t-shirt. Can you imagine? We were delirious when we saw this in Business Week. <laughs> Don't we all dream of early retirement? Uh, it's a fantasy, I know, for many of us. But no, for me, I was too young. I was only 45 years old. I didn't quite know what to do with myself. I was at risk of becoming a beach bum. Can you picture me here on this beach? I turned to an old hobby of mine, uh, photography. I'd always had about a dozen cameras. I started shooting landscapes, then portraits. And a friend of mine in New York saw my enthusiasm for this. He made an introduction for me to the High School for the Performing Arts in New York City, LaGuardia High School. And I became a dance photographer, of all things. What a thrill. Look at all that hair. <laughs> and they needed someone to come in, and the kids needed headshots for their portfolios. It turned out. I was good at taking headshots, and I'd often get a nice reaction from my subjects. And then what I would do from time to time is email around photographs of my subjects, and my friends would enjoy that. And the kids were just fantastic to work with. They loved the photo studio. And of course, can you imagine, they would love hanging out in the studio much more than going to class. And then after the headshots were done, I didn't realize it, but the kids needed uh, these ballet poses for their college applications. Would I stay another month to do that? Yes, I would. Uh, who would have guessed I'd stay three more years? 
What was it about these young dancers that appealed to me, I found so fascinating? Well, discipline. They were much more disciplined than many of the programmers I had working for me at the time. But there was something else. They were doing what they loved. They had great passion for the, the dance. And after Wall Street, I found that quite refreshing, where it's easy for me to look back and think everything was about making a killing. So it was very satisfying for me to take these photographs and to help share them with the world. The world would learn about their talents. But it wasn't all so serious. Every dance needs a poster. Here's my first one. It's kind of fun, huh? And I'm doing all this in New York. Well, I'm living in California, too. I should be shooting dance in California. So I cold called Donald McHale at UC Irvine. Here's a picture of him, one of my first pictures of Donald. He was in the original cast of West Side Story. Makes him about 80 years old today. Well, I cold called Donald, as I told you. He took my call, and shortly thereafter, I'm shooting at UC Irvine. And now I'm a bi-coastal dance photographer shooting high school and university. Word gets around, and the next thing you know, I'm shooting professional dance groups in Los Angeles. And think about it. Who wouldn't like to be a dance photographer, really, huh? <laughs> well, I think, though, that around this time, my wife was having some questions come to mind, my enthusiasm for this new line of work. Here, I wanted to show you my one perfect ballet shot. To take a picture like this, you've got to freeze the action. And then you take the picture, but there's, that's not even half of it. It has to be approved. Their positions have to be perfect. Their smiles, just so. And then the faculty have to favor the subjects as well. Oh, can you imagine? I bristled at that. I wanted to see movement, action, like this. My work started to change. A question for the audience now, is this too many dance photos? Should I have titled this the dance of entrepreneurship instead? <laughs> well, maybe just a few more. Meet, meet my friend, Leo from New York. He called me up one day to invite me to a rehearsal. And I had met him through the high school. I had lost track of him, so I was glad to hear from him. And he called me up and he said, Frank, uh, a little private rehearsal just for a few friends. Would you come please? Certainly, I would like to. He says, there's just one thing, he concludes. You can't bring your camera. And I go, what? what do you mean? Why would you say that? Well, he wouldn't say. He wouldn't tell me that he was now dancing with Mikhail Baryshnikov's White Oak Group. And uh, that had to be a tremendous thrill for him. This was the first time I met Misha. I would cross paths with him several times over the next few years, like here at Santa Barbara. Misha loved working with young talent, and he admired the work that I was doing with the students at the high school in New York. Well, one thing led to another, and a short while later, I am on tour with Baryshnikov for three weeks in Europe photographing White Oak Group. It was a great thrill. Well, I am accumulating quite a body of work, and after I email this photo around, one of my friends in Los Angeles says, Frank, you ought to do a book. I took it as a personal challenge. And I created Dreams of Grace. And here's a, a mention. I have a copy of Dreams of Grace for each and every one of you today to take home for free. Huh? Yes. Thank you. That's how I succeed as a speaker. I bribe my audiences. <laughs> the book was something, meant something else to me, though, too, is it was a way for me to close out this chapter of my life. I felt like I had climbed Mount Everest of the dance world. That's how I phrased it. It wasn't going to get any better than that. And at the same time, there was a part of me that was kind of itching to get back to the business world. While I was shooting dance, my brother had joined Tech Coast Angels. Tech Coast Angels is an organization of mostly retired entrepreneurs who mentor and invest in uh, startup businesses. It's fun, it's very stimulating, and it can be quite lucrative. Well, this is where my credentials as an entrepreneur were really going to matter. So I joined too. And I made a lot of friends. This really was 
a place where I belonged. And I would sit down with them. Each one of them would uh, be happy to share with me their background and probably more importantly, their advice how to succeed at being an investor and start a businesses. Would they let me record their stories and their advice? Yes, they would. So I hosted these on The Frank Peters Show. People often ask, how did I come up with the name? <laughs> well, I would accumulate great advice, I felt, like this. My good friend Ray Leach, he's appeared on this show a few times, and I think what he's hinting at here is many of the stories that we've all seen in the papers where most jobs created in this country today are being created by small business. Well, investors, my fellow investors, that was only half of the story. The entrepreneurs, that was the other half of the story. They, would, they wouldn't have any idea what was expected as they approached an angel group. It was like trying to gain entrance to an exclusive club. If you weren't on the list, if you weren't a member, you couldn't attend. So without them knowing what we expected, is it, can you imagine what they looked like to us as they approached? They looked pretty delusional much of the time. And they wouldn't be able to see the flaws in their own plans, but would often see something that we liked. And for me, as perhaps a storyteller, I would see great drama in their stories. They were out to raise money to fulfill their dreams. But at the same time, I had work to do. They needed to learn what we were really expecting from entrepreneurs. Take, for example, talent and inspiration. Of course. A commitment. They had to be crazy about their ideas, but at the same time, balance. We wanted someone who would listen because with this gray hair, we think, comes some wisdom. Determination. They'd have to be just so committed to their idea and never take no for an answer. And coachable. How, what kind of person is a good listener but never takes no for an answer? That's a question, it's some irony in that. But when we find such a person, we say they're very coachable. But perhaps most important of all to investors is we look to see passion, much like in those dancers. So whether you're starting a new business or you're investing in startups, it's easy to imagine. There's great risk for all of us. That's where the advice on my show, and I'll wrap up with a few thoughts of advice here. Chuck Martin was a, a, gr a real get for me, a real catch when I got him on the show. Why is that? Chuck Martin, the original venture capitalist in Orange County, a former chairman of the Orange County Art Museum as well. And he has this advice for investors. And by this, he means he finds opportunities in sometimes the strangest places. And so look at everything. For me, I often say that I'm the biggest beneficiary of my own show. I get to meet all my guests and talk to them. Sometimes I find their advice, their comment comes in the form of a question. As in, what's the exit? My friend John May, here we are sharing a beer together in Istanbul earlier this year. We were together again just this past weekend in San Juan, Puerto Rico. This question is the kind of question that investors often ask entrepreneurs, and it's in reference to the Frank Peters show itself. What's the exit, Frank? How are you going to someday turn this into a lot of money? Well, it's a question I'm used to. And I don't have the answer figured out. And I'm resigned to the fact that maybe the Frank Peters Show isn't going to be a big exit. I'm a plotter. Much like the Frank Peters Show, it's growing slowly. The audience is growing steadily, though. But what I told my friend John is, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And I can see myself doing this well into the second half of my life. Well, John reflected on this. and. I think he gave it some thought because the next morning he approached and he had a book recommendation for me.
Because I had my Kindle with me last weekend, I was able to download the book and start reading it on the long flight home. The book, Randy Commissar's The Monk and the Riddle. Randy Commissar, a super angel, it's called, from Silicon Valley. He makes large investments in startup companies. And his comment, well, it seemed to be a, a fitting thought for me. It's a great thought to share on my show. And I've built a platform for sharing great ideas. And it's something I see myself continuing to do. I enjoy it. I do it with great passion. Thank you very much. Thank you.